The arguments flew back and forth in the Japanese courts. One side pushed for war against Shila. The other side urged caution and fancied building up defenses at home instead. It was the year 650, and the courts had just received the news that Shila allied itself with the Tong dynasty. Crown Prince Nakano Oe decided against war. Instead, he sent diplomatic missions to China in hopes of improving relations. These missions were the ancient kingdom equivalent of waving on Facebook, except it doesn't get you caught stalking your ex on the phone. Oh, uh, hi Megan, how's the new boyfriend? If you have one, that is. Not that I know if you do or not. I really don't know, I just assumed. Haha. <laughs> Can I have my DVDs back? The Tong were delighted with the visits, but rumors soon spread that Tong and Sheila would attack Kuguryo. This was bad news, and Prince Nakanooe made plans to move the capital from the port city of Naniwa to the safer, more inland Asuka region. The prince was balling, so he decided to put the new capital on top of a mountain. It was a massive public works project. They had to dig a canal for boats to bring in huge boulders. The money and labor needed made the project unpopular with the people and the court. Some disgruntled nobles even plotted to remove Prince Nakanooe because of it, but they got caught before anything happened. In 660, Tong and Shila defeated Pekche as we saw in the previous video. Pekche was placed under Tong military supervision, prompting a wave of Pekche refugees to flee to Japan. When they arrived, Japan said, Welcome, you'll be safe here. Now get to work. The refugees brought over new technologies and became a major source of skilled labor. Tong forces soon left Pekche, their next target, Kuguryo. Immediately after Daddy left, Pekche rebels emerged, vowing to restore the Pekche royal family. They just needed one thing someone from the Pekche royal family. The rebels sent an envoy to Japan and asked for two things. One, military help, please, oh god, please. And two, a member of the Pekche royal family. If you remember the previous video, Pekche had sent a person to Japan as hostage in 631. This was Prince Peng of the Pekche royal family. And the rebels wanted him on the Pekche throne. The Japanese court wholeheartedly supported the Pekche restorationists. They may have decided to help even before the rebels came to ask. It was a time of falling kingdoms. They feared that Koguryo would fall next, and then there would be nothing stopping Tong or Shila from coming after Japan. At this time, Prince Nakanooe ascended the Japanese throne to become Emperor Tenji. His first order of business? A war to restore Pekche. He sent Prince Peng home to the rebels. On the peninsula, the rebels were already at war with Shila forces. Emperor Tenji sent 27,000 men to assist them. The fighting went on until, in 663, Shila forces besieged the rebels at their base of operations along the Pekang River. What ensued was called the Battle of Pekang, or Battle of Baekang, depending on which bad pronunciation you prefer. The historical texts are not clear on the details of the battle, but here's what we know. A Japanese fleet moved up the Pekang River to lift the siege. It was 10,000 Japanese soldiers strong, we don't know how many ships it had. Some Pekche restorationists also came along, but we don't know how many of them were there either. The other side sent their own ships down the river. They had 170 Tong ships and an unknown number of Shila ships. Whatever their size, the Japanese fleet was apparently many times bigger. Normally, that kind of numbers advantage would allow the Japanese to encircle the other side and crush them. But the narrow river allowed the Tong to cover its entire width and fend off attacks and flanking maneuvers. The Japanese, confident of their size advantage, tried to pound the enemy with brute force. Waves of Japanese ships broke against the Tong barrier, but failed to penetrate it. Over time, the repeated attacks tired the Japanese, who were no doubt frustrated that it was taking so long. Seizing upon a moment of disorder from the other side, the Tong navy pierced through the Japanese flanks. They surrounded the Japanese and just went to town, demolishing the larger force. The historical texts say that 400 Japanese ships were destroyed. Remember that the Tong only had 170 ships. This was checkmate for the Pekche restoration plans, and the rebels surrendered. After the battle, the remaining Japanese forces retreated back home, bringing with them another batch of Pekche refugees. The Tong placed a Muppet government in Pekche. 
The Battle of Pekong actually wasn't a big deal to the Tong, and turned out it wasn't a big deal to the Japanese either. It was kind of anticlimactic. Sure, it was Japan's largest defeat on the continent so far, and with Kaya defeated decades ago and now with Pekche gone, Japan lost any political hold it had on the peninsula. But in just a few years, after Tong and Shila sent some diplomatic missions, Japan resumed friendly relations with the peninsula and China. Sure enough, pretty soon, Tong and Shila finished off Koguryo. All in all, Shila came out ahead, controlling the entire peninsula. Japan also came out ahead. The feared foreign invasion never came. Japan ended up with a large pool of skilled labor in the form of immigrants from the peninsula. These immigrants brought with them new technology, culture, and administrative techniques for strengthening the central government. So I kind of glossed over things that happened after the Battle of Pekong because it's mostly Korean history, not Japanese. I think I'll write a blog post about what happened on Patreon for the patrons. See that? Marketing. Nah. But hey, I put a lot of work into these videos. If you like them, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You'll get to read blog posts about stuff that didn't go into the videos, plus access to our Discord chat server. But mostly, you'll be supporting an independent creator. Thanks guys. And thank you to our new patron, Neo Nippon. Welcome.